For Kremer Media's Quality, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is former group treasurer at SAA, Cynthia Stimpel, to discuss Whistleblower House. So, Cynthia, your organization that you've started with the other South African whistleblowers, uh, which suffered as a result of standing up to corruption, has uh, made headlines recently. Can you tell us how the idea of starting this organization started? Much earlier, after I gave evidence at the Zonda Commission, I connected with quite a few whistleblowers, and we just started a support group, which was a WhatsApp group. And we met as often as we could, and just to share our stories. And as we started speaking, we all realized there was so much commonality in our stories, And we all felt that we needed to do something for whistleblowers. So I started my own smaller organization called Citizens of Conscience at the time. And that was mainly just my support group, the WhatsApp group, and seeing how we could help one another in a small way. And then Bianca Goodson, who's also a whistleblower, felt the need to, and she hooked up with Liesl Grunewald, and they decided to form the Whistleblower House. When they contacted me, they had similar ideas to what I had. And then in a, we met up in a meeting and decided, well, let's um, combine our um, skills and look at collaboration. And that's when I joined the Whistleblower House. So we launched, although a lot of work was done last year in the background discussion, how do we do it? What's our business plan? What's our focus? Who do we intend to help? We launched earlier this year in 22nd of February, and here we are, the Whistleblower House. For those, Cynthia, who who may not know your story, who are not aware of what happened to you, can you just briefly share with our viewers? My background has always been in banking, and then I worked for SAA. It was in my role as SAA, as the group treasurer, in my last two years, that I came across a procurement transaction whereby the deal was going to bypass our governance processes and bring in a third party to source funding for SA, whereas normally my team and I would source funding directly with the banks. And we do it at the cost of our salaries, so no additional payment. And obviously with the banks, there is a margin that you pay. In this case was that between our executive and our board, they wanted a third party to source these funds. And the cost would have been 256 million, literally a quarter of a billion rand. And so I tried to stop it internally first through speaking to the peer groups, my own direct boss, um, our executive managers, etc., and even National Treasury, and eventually went out. But I managed to stop the transaction from happening and SAA being able to pay out 256 million, which they would not have recouped. And the consequences to myself and detriment to myself was I got suspended and lost my job for that. So that's what happened to me. Our country recently witnessed the shocking death now of Babita Diokoran, who was gunned down for standing up to the PPE scandal in Gauteng. And we've seen that Adol Williams also fled the country, fearing for his life. What kind of support are you planning to provide uh, to the whistleblowers? Indeed, those events were really tragic for Babita Diokoran totally unexpected for someone who was just speaking up for the truth and doing the right thing. And the same with Ethel Williams now having to uh, work out of our country for fear of his life and his family. So what we're trying to achieve as whistleblowers is exactly to protect that whistleblower and provide them the service that is so much needed. So one of our services would be access to legal fraternity. The second would be to security and physical safety. The third would be to psychological services because we realize how many whistleblowers go into depression and suffer thereafter. The fourth thing would be financial. The fifth is probably a medical and uh, and looking long-term at your family situation. So if I may just clear around it, we playing the role 
as facilitator rather than providing the services because we cannot become a legal company or a financial company or security company. What we're currently doing and have been doing in the past months is facilitating the role of speaking to the legal society and saying to them, can you provide pro bono services or can you provide these services at a reduced cost? We've written to quite a few, had a meet, meetings with a few, and we now have quite a few on board who want to help from a legal perspective. We have the psychological society on board who's willing to help with the psychosocial services. We're currently still speaking to the medical society to getting doctors on board. And we currently speak in two of the security organizations to provide two parts. The one is upgrade of security for homes, those that don't have sufficient security. And the other is to protect the person personally if we can allow that and afford it. The financial is the only one we haven't tackled yet. We've put a request out for donations. I think it's much more harder to get donations, but we still believe it will come. There are people donating, but we're looking at the bigger corporations now to start donating. So that's the role we're going to be playing and fulfilling. And what about those now who may be scared to come out, who wish to come out and expose corruption that uh, may be affecting our government in different ways? Are you able to help those people? Sonia, that is really the crucial question we faced with, you know, in our country, in that it is so hard to speak out when you see what's happening around you and you need to protect yourself and your family. So our plan there is to encourage people to speak out and perhaps come directly to the whistleblower house without putting their names out in the public space just yet for fear of losing their jobs. So if they can come directly to the whistleblower house and we find the right medium for them, the right legal company to hold their hand through the process, the psychological company walking next to them to hold them, that they don't go into depression, that they have those first few meetings so that they do not lose their jobs, but they have the ability to speak out in a comfort zone. And that way, their names can be protected. So that would be the ideal situation. We haven't achieved that yet. It's to start talking far more often in the public space so that people know here's a place I can talk and let my story out that I'm witnessing some wrongdoing or fraud or anything like that. And at the same time, I can still keep my job. So yes, it's going to be a lot of work. It's also going to take a lot of courage from individuals to speak out and come to us. Whistleblower House is also formed as the State Capture Commission is releasing the critical reports which might put other people's lives at risk. Do you think it is critical to involve our government in protecting the whistleblowers? Because most of the time they go out of their way to protect state funds. We need to work with government. We need to collaborate with them. So we will be talking to various arms of government as we work and grow as an organization, we have already on our, our list that we need to set up meetings with the MPA, with the SIU, with the other arms of government. And because we may get information that would help them, that we need to pass on to them. And we also need to that they they've been tasked to protect whistleblowers in a way. And so we need to have that collaboration to protect whistleblowers on a holistic view. Are you able to share with our viewers some of the members that you've teamed up with in forming this organization? So our first, our chairperson of the board is Ivan Pillay. We all, he's well known with, um, he's previously worked at the SARS and he's been very good in providing us with strategic direction. We then have Liesl Grunewald, who works for the Ethics Institute, has been very involved in whistleblowing legislation internationally and, with, and in South Africa, and has given good guidance for us as the whistleblower house. And then the third person is Ben Theron, whose prior experience is working with government and working with OUTA, the organization undoing tax abuse. 
And then last but not least is two whistleblowers, Miss Martha Nguya, who is the Prasa whistleblower. She's uh, also a director. And then myself, um, Cynthia, obviously. Um, but only two of us are hands-on doing the work, which is Ben and myself. And how do people contact you in case they, they wish uh, to be assisted or they wish to maybe uh, fund your organization? That would be so awesome if they can fund our organization. And yes, please, we invite people to contact us. So we have a website called www.whistleblowerhouse.org. And then our email is very simple as well, info at whistleblowerhouse.org. If they send the emails there, we will reply to them within 24 hours. There was Cynthia Stimpel in conversation with Polity about Whistleblower House.